Here we are, back again, number three. Look, think about where we are right now. We've talked about Mendel and his pea plants and what he found. Some strange stuff, and we still don't know exactly why he found that, but we're getting there. Also recall in the first video, we talked about uh, the fact that in each of our cells as humans, we have 46 chromosomes, and we received 23 from each parent. Now think about what that means. As we had said, I received 23 from mom, 23 from dad, there's my 46 chromosomes in each of our cells. But that also leaves us with an interesting problem. Let's look at one gene in particular. Let's say mom gives us, passed along a gene for head size. You know, Bentley has a huge, abnormally large velociraptor egghead. Let's say she passed along the dominant gene for big egghead, while dad passed along the recessive, and we're, again, we haven't tackled what those terms mean yet, but a different form of the gene, we'll write that as little b, which codes for normal-sized head. Doesn't look like a freak like Bentley. Now this presents a problem for us, because if we think about it, each parent passed on one complete set of DNA, or one copy of every single gene. If we start off with two copies of every gene in our cells, the million dollar question is, how do my two copies of each gene segregate or separate so that I would only pass on one copy of each gene? In other words, if I had in my cells that big B and little b that we mentioned a few seconds ago, how do they separate or segregate so I pass on either the big B to my offspring or the little b? And the answer to this is going to seem very familiar to us. It's another type of cell division called meiosis. This may look and sound like mitosis, and in fact, it, it's very similar. A lot of the phases and chromosome behaviors and actions are going to be just like in mitosis, but there are a few differences, and that's what we want to focus on today. So how exactly is it different? And, and to start off with the basic points, here they really are. We still, just as in mitosis, are going to start out with, quote unquote, normal cells, 46 chromosomes. Remember, two sets of 23. And because they have two sets of 23, we refer to them as diploid. Note the prefix di, two sets, one from mom, one from dad, just like all of our cells. But where we're going to differ here is that we're still going to have the same actions, if you will, prophase, metaphase, a lot of the things we learned last unit with mitosis. but we're going to end up going through two rounds of cell division instead of one. And instead of, as we did in mitosis, ending up with one cell turning into two, if you will, identical cells with 46 chromosomes, we're going to end up with four cells, we'll see, and that actually will have 23, or half the number of chromosomes. And the term haploid kind of looks and sounds like half. So again, in other words, quickly here, ignore some of these details. We'll look at those in a moment. But our cell, notice our chromosomes. We've copied them. They'll split, but our end result is not another identical cell. We actually have four cells, and they're going to have half the number. Note that diploid is referred to as 2n, as we can see here and here, two sets of n chromosomes. Haploid is often written as just this little lowercase n, because it has half the number. It's one half of 2n. And again, if we look at this schematic diagram, you can see if you weren't paying careful attention, it looks just like mitosis. There's prophase and spindle fiber formations and chromosomes uh, condensing, chromosomes lining up at the middle, chromosomes splitting apart, cells splitting apart, chromosomes lining up, just like we saw before. But there, what we're going to see is that there really are three key differences that are going to yield these strange four haploid daughter cells, and that's what we want to focus on. So the logical place to start is with the first step here, prophase. Notice it's prophase 1, because we actually will have two prophases. Our DNA, just as in mitosis, condenses into chromosomes. That's just like mitosis. I've left that in white here, but I've written in red, as we can see. These are different from mitosis. In prophase 1 in meiosis, what are called homologous chromosomes pair up and crossing over occurs. What the heck does that mean? Now to understand what these terms truly mean, 
we've got to look at, again, as we usually do, some of the nerdy prefixes. Remember, the prefix homo means same. So notice here and here, there are blue and red chromosomes. Let's say now, for just to make things simple, that blue came from dad. We received that chromosome set. All the blue ones came from dad. And the red came from mom. Easy enough. Now notice these chromosomes right here are the same size, the same shape. And the reason we call them homologous is because they're going to carry very, very, very similar, but not necessarily the same, genetic information. Let's go back to my giant egghead, because it is fascinating. There I am. There's my scrawny little chicken neck. Big egghead. Reseeding hairline, of course. And look, it's Bentley. Hmm. Nah, that's not what I meant. But let's go back and think about those genes. Let's say, as we said earlier, that mom gave us a right here on this region, because remember, genes are located on chromosomes, gave us a big B gene for a giant egghead. Dad, at the same spot on the chromosome that we received from him, also has a gene for egghead. But notice it's not the same. He passed on the little b. These are homologous chromosomes, same size, same shape and similar genetic information. It's almost as if the chromosomes realize, hey, we're just like each other. Let's snuggle up here and get right next to each other. Now, over here, with the crossing over, this is really crazy. Sometimes, once in a while, randomly, for no rhyme or reason, these chromosomes, because they're so similar, can actually, as you can see, as the name implies, cross over and swap information. What we really mean is that the big B gene that was on mom's chromosome here could actually transpose itself and end up on the blue chromosome. Vice versa, dad's little B gene can swap spots and end up on that red chromosome. But keep in mind, this is happening all within one of my cells. These are my chromosomes now. They're not in mom, they're not in dad, they're in me, which is kind of a strange, strange idea. So now that our chromosomes are all snuggled up and have our DNA is condensed into chromosomes, we've had some crossing over and they've done what they've had to do. Just like in mitosis, our next phase is metaphase. But here, notice, remember, metaphase one. Just like in mitosis, they line up in the middle, but I do have some red here. Pause for a minute and look at this. And, and what's different here in metaphase one in meiosis compared to metaphase in mitosis? Well, there's not too much of a difference, really. They're still lined up in the middle. They still have spindle fibers attached. But notice how they're lined up. They're lined up not single file. As we said over here, chromosomes are lined up in their homologous pairs. Big deal, right? Well, it is. Because look at our microtubules, our spindle fiber attachment. This one attaches to that entire chromosome made up of, remember, exact copy, sister chromatids. This one attaches here. That's going to lead to some big changes, some big differences as we go down the line here in just a second. But as simple as it is, meta, middle, we're lined up. But that lining up in the pairs is a big, big deal. So remember, after metaphase, we now transition into anaphase. And remember, anaphase one. Just like in mitosis, ana, away, apart. In mitosis, our chromatids were separated to opposite ends of the cell. Remember, what that means is that we were literally were simply separating, ripping apart our sister chromatids. This one would go to one cell, that one would go to one cell. Notice that didn't happen here. Here, we're separating the homologous pairs. This entire X, both copies, travel to one side. This entire X, or chromosome, travels the other side. Now, one thing to note that's kind of a big deal also. Notice it looks like this guy was dipped in red paint. This guy was dipped in blue paint on the ends. That's because they crossed over back in prophase one. But here, notice that our whole entire chromosomes, and note our sister chromatids, are still attached, move to opposite ends of the cell. and. Continuing on, think about what's going to happen in telophase. They'll get to opposite ends, these three chromosomes up here, these three chromosomes down here. And if we think about moving on, what's going to transpire is in telophase one, 
into cytokinesis, we're going to divide into two cells. Notice our pinching in. Well, that's no different. However, notice the cells starting to form here. This cell now only has one, two, three chromosomes in it. This cell has one, two, three chromosomes in it. Recall that's different because at our start, we had six chromosomes. Now, we only have three. In essence, we've gone from, remember our terminology, diploid, to if we only have three, we're now haploid. We've cut our chromosome number in half. Or to change these numbers, go back to normal human cells. We started out with 46. At this point, when we divide into two cells, we'd be down to 23. We now are haploid. We're halfway to our goal. We wanted to cut our chromosome number in half. Remember, because our sole purpose here is to make sperm cells or weird looking eyeball egg cells. That's my egg cell. Shut up, stop laughing at me. But we're halfway there. And that's kind of a big deal also. Oh man, so looking down at the timer, I see that I've broken my rule yet again. I promised you I'd stick to under 10 minutes, but I can't help it. I just get so excited. But the good news is we're practically done. We now have two cells that are haploid. All we need to do now is go through meiosis two. And this one's easy. It's just like mitosis. Notice that in every single case, each of our cells, because we do have two of them, are our cells the same? Is the information in this cell the same as the information in that cell? No way. Similar size chromosomes, similar shape, but they're carrying different content. So here's our prophase two. Metaphase two, they line up single file because there are no longer pairs. And now here in anaphase two, just like mitosis, we actually ripped our sister chromatids apart. So each of our copies go to opposite ends. We begin to divide, pinch in here. Telophase two, we connect back into, or condense rather, back into chromosomes, into nuclei, and we split. We now have one, two, three, four cells. And look at those four cells. None of them are exactly the same. Each of them has a large chromosome and a small one here in this case. Note that we have a different number here from our original six and three. But the information, the genes in this one are slightly different from the genetic information in this one, slightly different from the genetic information in this one, and you get the idea. Hmm. So we've done it. We went from one cell that was diploid to four cells that are haploid. These are our gametes. These are our sperm and eggs, or our pollen, if you think back to Mendel's little frisky flower sex he had going on earlier. So what do we end up with, as we said? Four haploid cells, slightly different contents. We've gone from, in humans, 46 to four cells with 23, and each one's different. Perfect. And to end with, how is it different from mitosis? Well, we have two rounds of division instead of one. In prophase one, again, this is just my red text I had earlier, homologous chromosomes pair up and cross over. We didn't get that in mitosis. We also didn't get them lining up in pairs during metaphase of mitosis, but we do in meiosis. And when we split, essentially, really, our differences are in meiosis one. Meiosis two is just as, as in mitosis, but this allows us to cut our chromosome number in half and to diversify and mix up our genes. Perfect. We'll skip the video for now and end with that visual. Hmm. Now, there's a lot of information in here, and it's a little tricky, a little sketchy. So we're going to have to employ some uh, several different uh, activities here after you watch this video to put this into practice, to simulate, to try our hand at understanding and working with meiosis. Because there can be one activity we'll look at. Just as with anything, there can be mistakes. We're going to end up looking at something called a karyotype, which is essentially a picture of a person's chromosomes. Notice there are pairs of chromosomes. Here are homologous pairs, one from each parent, and there are 23 of them. Notice that our last pair here we'll look at later on are not a perfect match sometimes. This is what determines, as they're named, sex chromosomes, what determines our sex. But this is a way for scientists to look at a person's genetic information in terms of chromosomes and see if there are any problems. So let's go ahead and stop the video and practice these and see if we can sharpen our meiosis understanding.